Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The pastor, Nadia Boltz Weber, started a church in Denver called House of All Sinners and Saints. She is a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, and she came to her pastoral calling through her 12-step group. She has a penchant for curse words and a lot of tattoos, and her church has attracted all kinds of people, including those who never thought someone like them could be welcome in a church. As a community, they like to say, we are anti-excellence, pro-participation, meaning that the worship each week is led by the people who show up. So services can be unpredictable. What is predictable, as she shared in a recent interview, is that that congregation tends to find the scriptures hilarious. When someone reads the day's lesson, People don't just sit there quietly and reverently. They usually laugh out loud in church. I wonder if that's what happened. When Jesus first spoke this series of blessings we have come to know as the Beatitudes, I wonder if people laughed out loud or if they stood there staring with their mouths hanging open. If they weren't rendered speechless, they might have said, I'm sorry, Jesus, did you just say, blessed are the poor and those who mourn and those who are persecuted? If we really allow ourselves to hear these words as if for the very first time, whether we find them hilarious or just confusing, we have to admit that these words bear no resemblance to our understanding of what it means to be blessed. In my sermon last week, I mentioned Kate Bowler, the professor who had the perfect job, marriage, and new baby boy when she was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Well, there's more to her story. She teaches at Duke Divinity School as a professor of the history of Christianity in North America. Her particular expertise is the American prosperity gospel, that megachurch movement whose adherents believe that God grants health and wealth to those with the right kind of faith. In fact, Bowler's first book was titled Blessed. Now, she studied the prosperity gospel as a scholar and historian. Although she is a Christian, that is not her particular theology. At least she didn't think it was. Until she was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer at age 35 and became instantly and undeniably aware of just how much she had succumbed to the belief that we can earn our way to a happy, healthy, beautiful, social media worthy life. That we can earn God's love and blessing by doing faith right. Truth be told, most of us have succumbed to this belief 
And it's no accident. It is embedded, both explicitly and implicitly, in many of our scriptures, including the psalm we heard this morning. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. The word translated happy is a Hebrew word that can also be translated blessed, and it's a word that corresponds to what Jesus uses in the Beatitudes. This psalm is clear. God's blessing comes to those who make the right choices, who stay on the right path. Now, there are plenty of texts in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament that suggest there is more than this to God's blessing. It's not just about happiness and health, and it's not predicated on what we do to earn it. But none of these texts are clearer or more disorienting than the Beatitudes. On an episode of the presidential drama, The West Wing, Press Secretary C.J. Craig and Deputy Chief of Staff Josh Lyman meet with three members of the organization Cartographers for Social Equality. They are lobbying for the administration to pursue legislation that would require schools to use the Peters projection map of the world instead of the popular Mercator projection created by the German cartographer Mercator in 1569. His map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines when the map is projected onto a flat surface, and this distorts the land masses on the map. On the Mercator projection, the cartographers explain, Greenland and Africa appear to be roughly the same size, but in reality, Africa is 14 times larger. Alaska appears three times bigger than Mexico, when Mexico is the bigger landmass. And if that weren't unsettling enough, Germany, which appears to be roughly located right in the middle of the Mercator map, is actually located in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait, Josh says. Are you telling me Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing's where you think it is, the cartographer replies. Now, I know you might be dying to see the Peters projection, so go ahead. If you have a smartphone, Google it. You can see what it looks like. It's a little unnerving. When CJ and Josh are then shown the Peters projection for the first time and told that this map has fidelity of axis and position, CJ blurts out, what the hell is that? And one of the cartographers responds, it's where you've been living this whole time. By the time we get to the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel, the writer has gone to great lengths to convince us that this is the story of God's promised Messiah, the one predicted by the Hebrew prophets, the one the Jewish people have been longing for, the one who will overthrow the ruling powers and set God's people free. But from the beginning of his life until the end, Jesus is not the Messiah the people were expecting. And more than anything else he says, it is the Beatitudes that reveal that what we thought we knew about who God is and how God works bears little resemblance to reality. We aren't living where we thought we were. Now, these blessings are not conditional statements. You are blessed if you are mourning, or if you are poor in spirit, or if you are persecuted. They are pronouncements. Jesus is simply stating facts. And these facts don't just resize the land masses on our spiritual maps. They throw the whole map out the window. Not only are we not living in the world we thought we were, But God isn't who we thought God was. That Hebrew word in Psalm 1, the one that usually gets translated happy or blessed, its literal meaning is to find the right road. What happens if we view the Beatitudes through this lens? What if Jesus is saying is that wherever you find yourself today, you are on the right road? 
and you are on the right road, you are blessed because there is no circumstance where God cannot be found. There is no situation God is not seeking to transform through God's mercy and love. What if Jesus is saying that God's blessing is not revealed by our external circumstances or appearances, but by God's relationship with us, God's determination to be with us no matter what? God's blessing is not earned because we do something right, and it's not proportional to how healthy or wealthy or happy or successful we appear to be. The Beatitudes claim that it is the very nature of God not to pick and choose who God favors, but to favor all people even those who may look like they've been singled out for suffering, even those we think are the last people who deserve God's blessing. In her writing about the Beatitudes, Nadia Boltz Weber imagines Jesus offering us some updated blessings. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the underemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the wrongly accused and those without documentation. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who know there has to be more than this because they are right. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the burned out social workers and the overworked teachers and the pro bono case takers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the kids who step between the bullied and the weak. Blessed are the persecuted. Given the news of this past week, I would like to add a few more Beatitudes today. Blessed are the families whose hearts are broken because a loved one's life has been cut short by senseless violence and lax gun laws. Blessed are the ones crying out for peace and justice, who march and stand vigil and write letters and protest, who dare speak truth to power. Blessed are teenagers, determined to make sure other schools are safer than theirs was, and who want the world to know that no one should live through what they did. Blessed are those who think and who pray and who act to create a world where human beings, no matter their age or color or immigration status, are more valuable than corporate prophets. Boltz Weber writes, I imagine Jesus standing there blessing us all because I believe that is our Lord's nature. After all, it was Jesus who came to us in the most vulnerable of ways as a powerless flesh and blood newborn, as if to say, you may hate your bodies, but I am blessing all human flesh. You may admire strength and might, but I am blessing all human weakness. You may seek power, but I am blessing human vulnerability. She goes on, this Jesus whom we follow cried at the tomb of his friend and turned the other cheek and forgave those who hung him on a cross. He was God's beatitude, God's blessing to the weak in a world that admires only the strong. For these next four weeks of Lent, we will continue to wrestle with these strange blessings that call us to a whole new way of understanding who God is and what it means to follow Jesus. Each week in worship, we'll be offering you some way to engage the text personally. Today, during the offering, Melanie and Kevin and I will pass around baskets and invite each of you to take a card. 
It has a picture of a compass on one side as a reminder that being blessed is not about what you have or what you have accomplished. It's about being on a journey with God and with one another. On this journey, our compass is Jesus, God's beatitude in the flesh, his words, his actions, his life, which are all constant reminders for us to reimagine our concepts of weakness and strength, power and love. The back of the card is blank, which is intentional. It is for you to use however you want. Write your grocery list on it or write down something in your life you long for God to bless. Doodle on it during a meeting or in class or make a list of people you want to forgive or that you want to forgive you or just leave it blank. Whether you look at this card every day between now and Easter or whether you throw it away as soon as you leave this sanctuary, may you know today and every day there is no path you can take where God does not accompany you. No state of mind, body, or spirit that God's love does not surround. Nowhere you can go where God is not waiting with open arms to call you beloved. Wherever you find yourself today, whatever path you are on, God is with you. And by that, you are blessed. Amen.